All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Try to get this thing started as fast as we can and get out of here even faster. So, my name's Lee Stewart. I teach over at Prague or Prague or Praha, however you want to pronounce it. And I'm going to give you my in insight on the CDE contest of sporting clays. And really, I wish we was actually at outside teaching about this to really get the full effect. This ain't something to really be taught about in class. It's more of an actually hands-on at a firing range. But more so for anybody who's beginners, what I'm here to really talk about is how to get yourself started and aware of what you need to do. So first thing that if you're going to be doing this contest and let's just say your school has nev never done it before, you have to prove to them that you are going to be safe. And for us to keep doing this contest, even for us who've been doing it for years, one little accident will, in my opinion, will make this contest stop immediately. And this is something that can also be unforgiving. So please always be safe with yourself, with your students at all times. How's the educational? How to set up yourself for success in this contest? Liability. How to cover yourself, your students, and your school. How to choose teams. You, I get more phone calls from parents on how do you select teams for this one contest than anything else we do in ag. It's crazy. Except for officer team. Except officer team. That's the only other one. And then firearms. I want to discuss a little bit about that. And don't use the G word. Okay. So, always automatically we teach the kids how to handle guns safely. Barrels pointed in the air, actions open at all times. Like I said, I wish we was at a firing range and I could have that in front of you right now and show you what I mean. In all contests, we use an over and over and under action built firearm, shotgun. One thing that's so nice about that shotgun is you can always tell by what? When it's open, you can tell what? If it's loaded and unloaded. Guess what, even if it's loaded, that action's open, it can't do nothing. That's one thing that I'm thankful that the wildlife department choose to go with an over and under instead of the pump actions. Because it's a lot safer, you can tell if they're being treated like by the students. An actual pump action gun or a semi-automatic, you can't tell. Even if the action's open, you cannot tell with that student walking around. So with that type of firearm, that barrel has to be pointed in the air no matter what. The over and under, if it's broke open, barrel can be pointed towards the ground and you can see what's going on. And maintenance. And we'll talk more about the stover that's being used for this contest with, through the wildlife department. I love the gun and then I truly, truly dislike it for many reasons. First thing, eyes and ears have protection on. And you have so many students that will fight you on this because they grew up not having eyes and ears. I'm talking about earplugs, earmuffs, safety glasses. Luckily, my dad's a veteran and he trained me to put that stuff on all the time. Because all the shop teachers in here I tell you this, with that, this contest, what we do for our own selves and our hobbies, we'd be deaf for sure. We wouldn't, we'd be blind. And our students need to know that as well. One thing about eyes and ears, I recommend earplugs. Air muffs, it can be really tough. If you're a short neck guy like me, I'm banging it against the stock every single time, and it's uncomfortable. Long neck person, possibly get away with it. Otherwise, 
I recommend actually using earplugs. Now, a little secret on your safety glasses. It can make your team the best shot out there or it can make them dead last, okay? And it depends on the clouds you have, the cloudy weather. If it's clear skies, dark tan glasses are the best, okay? It really is. Now, if it's overcast and, and everything else, they need to be shooting with an actual clear lens, possibly even a um, yellow or orange. I always recommend shooting with a yellow or orange lens. It makes that target come out a lot more easier to see. It catches their eyes. Kind of does like a 3D effect. But if it's overcast and they come out with dark glasses, they won't be able to see it whatsoever. Especially if there's any kind of backstop like trees or cedar trees behind where that tog is flying into, they can't see it. And for those who shoot at central area, we got these old railroad tie pillars and stuff. Um, power lines, we can't see anything half the time. It's, it's bad, isn't it? Sometimes some years we want it to be sunny, some days we don't. But right now, <clears throat> your safety glasses and what they shoot in that day or time of day can really affect their performance, believe it or not. What to do on a misfire? Okay. At practice, you have a student that pulls up, says pull, they pull the trigger. It does not go off. What's the first thing that student should do? Put safety on? I agree with that. Okay, should he automatically open that action? No. Guys, we are messing with science, chemistry, and magic all in once. Okay, that detonator got barely, maybe got pinged on there or not hard enough for that spark to go off and hit the powder. It could still be sizzling in, in that shotgun shell. And it can still go off with that kid opening that action. Guess what? He opens that action, where's that barrel pointed at? At his feet. So anytime you stu your student has a misfire, he needs to keep that barrel pointed down range for 10 to 15 seconds. It's where it needs to be pointed at. After the count of 15, 20 seconds even so, just to be extra certain to be safe, that's when you can open up the action, take that shell out, examine it. Some people will say, reshoot it, that, and I'm talking about that shell. I don't recommend that. I say discard that shell, make sure it can't get there, be used by any other student, okay? It's just something that can be an accident waiting to happen. Well, a lot of your students want to go ahead and just break that action open, take it out, look at the shell. No, keep that action closed, barrel down range. That's the most likely time that you probably have an accident that everybody's done everything by the book, but that's one of the first things that everybody thinks about, oh, it didn't go off, I didn't, I didn't put a shell in it. That's one of the reasons, too. Take 20 seconds, find out, oh, I didn't put a shell in. It's a lot safer. Gun rack versus the kids. So... When you have a group of kids, where old do they want to be at at the firing range? They want to be watching, but also they're ready for what? Their turn to shoot, right? So where are they already automatically standing at? Right behind the line, right by the gun rack, okay? Try to keep your students that are waiting to shoot separate from the gun rack. It saves time, actually. When you set it up just right, your course and everything, 
because I don't want to be having to watch my students all the time. Yes, I'm out there with another adult or two and a, and a coach, and we'll talk about that later, that helps me watch everything that's going on. But here's the thing, I don't want any other students met even close to the firearms whatsoever. So I make sure that they are fully separated. I highly recommend having a bleacher, a set of bleachers at your firing range. This is where you guys sit and watch until it's your turn to shoot. I've had one at my other school at Union City before. Made a world of difference. They set by the other shot. And also, a lot of kids get antsy out somewhere where they're at with no place to sit. That takes off a lot of their anxiety as well. Give them a spot to sit. Bleachers are very easy to make in your own shop. It can be done in a week or two. Make you a set of bleachers can, that can sit 10 to 15 kids. Okay, shell bags. And <clears throat> I've seen it done so many different ways where people have made their own shooting boxes, cages, just like the fire depart uh, wildlife department, excuse me. And we have two, and back in the day, <clears throat> My dad was actually the coach, and still is, that there used to be a little shelf to put their box of shells on, where, guess what, it kind of, over the years, got eroded and no longer works that way. Get you, get you some shell bags, okay? That's what the kids are going to use with the wildlife department. Use it at practice. Guess what? If you really want to save money, maybe get it for a donation, go to the hardware store. Get you a nail bag. Works just as well as that there. But this is one of the crucial pieces of equipment you need to have. Now, one big thing I don't like in this picture is the shells have already been dumped out of their box. Teach your kids to leave the shells in the box and put the box in the shell bag. It's a lot more easy, easy to handle, plus once you start figuring out how many times you shoot at each station, you know how many shells you have. Now, biggest thing is course setup for this contest. Not many places in the nation actually have a contest set up like this. Get you a hundred foot measuring tape. Once you get this taped off, it's really easy to know how or to keep the setup. Just remember station one, station two, station three, station four for each shooter. <clears throat> now, in this diagram, they really didn't put on how far away from each station the students are. Really, it's about two, three foot is all it is. Because the wildlife department used to or still does put an actual table uh, narrow ways <clears throat> in between each one because used to we put the pump actions in between them. So really there's only about two, three foot difference in between a, each station. The students are right there close to each other when they move on from left to right. <clears throat> there is one, two, three, four, five, six throwers, six targets that's going to be given to each student at multiple times in different ways. Thrower one, we call a till. It's a straight across target. Probably the hardest target to hit. Back in the day, it used to be a rabbit. I'll tell you this, made a lot of us mad because some of us would hit it and it wouldn't break. So they kind of changed the contest up in that fact. But the till, is right in, is right over here. For you to practice this and to practice it safely, make sure it's a automatic thrower with enough extension cord to reach out, and don't build a plywood cover shield 
and have someone actually hand throw it, don't do that. I'm, I've seen some schools do it, okay? So you have crossing left to right and then right to left over here. And number four is a straightaway. This number four bird, it should be a dead duck. That's how I put it every time. When you see me red in the face with my students, it's because they missed this one. And they know it. But if you take yourself a hundred foot measuring tape, you can set up this course. Now, here's the next question is, I may not have all these throwers. And that's a very, very good point. Not everybody has six to eight automatic throwers. I do know a way you can get them. And remind me if I forget the end of this, there is a way to get those. It may take some time, but you can. But one thing you can do is let's just say you have three throwers. Each practice, put two throwers here, one right here. One practice, you do that the entire time. Next practice, move your throwers over here. Practice that direction. That's how I got a, was able to train my students when we only had but three throwers. Okay? It wasn't that we all oh, put one here, one there, one there, and we each shot all the time. No, I still try to simulate what the course would be at contest. Instead of practicing it one full way, we practice it this way at one practice. Switch it up, did it this direction one practice. That way the students actually got a feeling of what to expect, okay? Because if I just put one on each side and one in the middle, we wasn't truly practicing what was being expected. We really wasn't. So I would always put maybe two over here. One would be the till. Next practice, one's the straightaway, the other two's the left to right. That's how we practiced when we didn't have enough throwers. Now, the not so secret recipe. No matter what, and this is on OKFA webpage. Each station, this is where they're going to be thrown. Station four is a single shot. And guess how many times you get to shoot at it? Twice. Okay? Number four, straight away. That should be a point no matter what. Five and six, two and three. Station two, throw one. Doubles, three and four, two and six. Have these on at your stations. Have these drilled into the students no matter what. They should be able to go to contest without having to see this at contest. They really do. And here's the thing. Understanding the rules can get a little bit hairy sometimes, especially if the kid is thrown a set, a set of targets, went ahead and shoot at them. Sometimes they go ahead and count that. So let's just say the wildlife, or I'm not gonna say the wildlife, but the actual thrower, Let's just say he pushed the wrong buttons, and this was supposed to be three and four, but it was two. But he threw two and six. Your student needs to realize that. Because if he went ahead and shoots it, he may go ahead and get counted on that. Especially if he misses it, and that's zeros. Will you go, will you go back just so that yes. Mr. Jones was asking exactly what was happening? So. Whenever they say that, they're saying from those positions, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's where the targets are being. So if you're at station one, what was the second combination? So, like station one, your single is number four being thrown. And then your first set of doubles might be two and three. And then your second, next set of doubles is six and five. But you're saying if they throw the wrong ones, your student should just hold off and not shoot? Didn't say if you threw the wrong targets? Yes. Highly. Because if, the, if they pull the wrong thing and your student still shoots them, 
and let's just say he misses them, it can be zeros. And this always turns into a big, big problem because try to know who's right, who's wrong. It's always, it's always been an ordeal because <clears throat> a lot of times I really wish we had some mulligans in this contest, like two mulligans, because if a kid forgets to load, forgets to load their shotgun, and I don't know why, but it happens that it's an RMAX zero for that student, and it's happened, and I don't know why a student would forget. I mean, let's just say a kid got deja vu for something, and he thought it, oh. I was getting thrown this pair, and the and the pooler was actually right. It just happens. But your kids need to know which sets they're being thrown. And it's also the advantage of them being already prepared on what direction they're coming from. Oops. So, like Mr. Jones, this is like our secret recipe. So that. Does this make more sense now? Yeah, I didn't understand the doubles, but that makes sense now. So like, this is thrower five, that's thrower five, that's thrower six. And they come at the same time. They're being thrown at exactly the same, same time. Now, Mr. Bruce, which is the hardest double on here? Correct, y'all correct. The hardest double on here is six and two, or two and six, because it's left and a right thrower coming across. That is the hardest double to hit on, on contest. Now, I'm going to give you another secret of what my opinion is, and that's at station two. Here's station two, here's thrower two, thrower six. Station two. Which thrower is it the closest, closest to? Two. I teach my kids, whatever thrower you're closest to, that's the one you need to shoot at first, no matter what. Because my student should be able to hit thrower two right about here when six is about to start dropping. And he can catch it a lot faster. Just like over here at station four, um, let me think here. Wherever station you're at and wherever you're being thrown on a double, wherever you're closest to should be the one your student needs to go for first. Another thing about that is climax, okay? A bird's going up. And you usually want to hit it on this climax. When it starts dropping, that's when you got to be triple times fast. Because now gravity is taking hold of it. And guys, gravity is a lot faster than what it was being thrown at. So you want to hit everything right on its climax. So always teach your kids to shoot when it's flying, flying or right when it's on its peak. When it starts dropping, that's when it gets really fast and crazy. Okay. Again, never miss four. If you want to see me red in the face, miss number four target. I don't know why. My kids can hit the hardest ones, but they can always miss the easy ones. Okay. I'm going to probably speed through some of that. All right. Seal shot versus lead shot. So this is what is your actual pellets, your BBs that's in your shotgun shell. Steel shot is heavier and more dense. Save for when hunting waterfowl for lead shot will kill waterfowl if ingested. So when you go hunting, you want steel shot not lead. However, when you're target practicing and you're not anywhere close to bodies of water, I highly recommend using lead. Steel shot is very, very rough on a barrel and a choke. And if you go buy yourself a 
Walmart brand of gun with cheap, cheap chokes, they're gonna break that choke all the time. Um, I, I never, I usually never keep any steel shot around. I'm not really a big duck hunter. I like to go quail hunting and pheasant hunting. But <clears throat> I hate it when my kids use steel shot. And most of the time they, they don't because I'm supply, supplying the shotgun shells. I usually always try to get lead because it's easier on my firearms that the school has. Steel shot is safer on waterfowl. However, it can tear up a barrel really, really fast. One thing, lead, once it goes through that barrel, lead can condense and form a little bit coming out of that barrel. However, steel shot, it doesn't. It's going to try to mostly expand on, your, on you sometimes going out that barrel. Lead, it can actually condense itself. So if you want to keep your guns healthy and maintain well, try your best not to use steel shot. Because we break chokes all the time. Liability. I always have my own permission slip before the kids can even come out. I have my own to cover myself, parents are aware of it, and I can show my school I have permission from this guardian or parent. Must be turned in before handling, even handling a shotgun. I put in the agreement with parents that you will be dismissed that a student may be dismissed for any reason, okay? There's too many people out there, too many scenarios that could happen that if they're just goofing off, you're done. Especially when it's like the first couple of practices. Like, they're there to learn. And my upperclassmen know that. They are there to teach these younger ones, these eighth graders, these freshmen that haven't came out here yet, just from how they act, how they go up to the gun rack, how they put the shell patch on, how they go to the firing line. That is training just watching those upperclassmen act safe. And if my eighth graders are not, or freshmen not acting right, goodbye because we don't have time for that, okay? I've had some just, just, that, just didn't care, and I'm like, see ya, there's no reason for you to be here. Have it in that agreement that for any reason you are, to, you are able to dismiss that student in your permission slip. Have, have it in there. I have a shooting binder, one that I keep track of practices, who, who came in, the times that they signed up, I, put, I also keep those permission slips in there. Another thing you're supposed to keep on hand or that you need to keep on hand for when you go to contest is their hunter safety ID or hunter safety number. I keep that in there as well. I have a quick question about hunter safety. So I live on the state line and so I have some students that have a Texas hunter safety and some students that have a does it matter what state it comes from? Just do they have proof that they've taken it, or does it have to be an Oklahoma under safety? Do you know? That's a good question. That would be something that's the wildlife department. Okay. But here's the thing, since the wildlife department online is now the NRA hunter safety, which is nationwide now, I don't I don't see how it would matter as long as it's a hunter safety ID from a from an actual state department, okay. wildlife department. I'll double check there then. But I don't know if there would be any difference there because the IDs themselves look different and the ID numbers are different. But if it's the same course, I would imagine it would be okay. But I would, um, that's just a question that I've got. I know who you need to contact to afterwards okay. for that one. Good question. Very good question. So, 
If you actually go into OKFFA and start reading the guidelines, it says your, your students are supposed to have eight hours of instruction or training. I know a lot of schools have probably missed that. Me, no one checks for that stuff, but I do. I like to keep that on hand. That way I have proof with my administration. They've had practice time. They've actually been doing this. They've been showing up. That's why you need to keep a record of that sign-in sheet for every practice when they come in. And pretty much one practice is two hours. Now, did that student shoot straight for two hours? No. He probably shot twice to maybe three times. But still, yet yeah, he was watching and learning from the others the entire time, and even from me lecturing to all the other, to one student about something, it still meant something to them no matter what. Okay? If I'm telling you something, that doesn't mean it won't, it's not the same for you as well. Keep record of your practices, your practice time, and of your students. Choosing teams. Multiple ways to pick. If resources are available, and I'm talking about shotgun shells, which right now we're going through a very tough time of getting them, I like to host several practices that basically we practice the entire time till maybe a week or two before contest. And that means I let anybody come to practice that's willing to come. Some years I've kind of had to kind of start that a little bit because I had 50 kids out there. Some years it was only 20. I'm like, okay, everybody gets to, gets to shoot twice. We'll, we'll decide team try we'll decide out who the team is two weeks before contest because I'm wanting everybody to get the opportunity to be a participant of this as much as I can um, have tryouts immediately that way more teams have more time to practice you can do that as well and there's nothing wrong with that at all and right now, that's probably my mentality because they're trying to actually get shotgun shells to practice with because there's a shortage right now and they are very, very tough to come by. Now, when I start doing the tryout, I have the kids shoot three times. They shoot three times. I take the two highest scores and I drop the lowest one, combine them together, and then I take my top shooters is how I do it. No. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It's okay. Where are you parked at? Right in the in the middle. Okay. Okay. In the U? Yes. Okay. Because always come to shooting, you're always gonna have one bad round. And I usually try not to let that hinder the kids as much as possible. So I made him shoot three times, take the top two, drop the lowest one. And it's always worked out very, very well for me. Questions on that? So or you used to like them after, when you don't just have an immediate tryout, do you use the last? Like the last practice? The last practice to select the team? Or yes. Or track of everything over time? No, I usually use the last practice. Now, if I had little RJ's mom over here, she keeps track all the time. <laughs> Trust me, if you have that one parent that's out there watching, they, they keep track for you. But no, so I don't keep track until that last practice. And then once we have, I'm just saying, if I already have my teams, I am keeping track to seeing what we're doing, what we're averaging. Yeah. What do you have to shoot to win? 25 every time? So, each individual student, that's a good question. To win this contest, and like I say, it depends on the year, it depends on the weather, especially for the state contest. It's cold, windy, who knows what. So, you can have a four man team or a three man team. If you have a four man team, the lowest score gets dropped like everything else in our, in our CDE contest. So, 
and the top score one student can get is 20 points. Perfect score. Okay, so if you have three kids that shoot 20 apiece, that's 60 points. What usually wins the state contest is anywhere from a 50 to a 55. And it's doable. Craig did it back six years ago with the, like a 52, 53. Some years it's been a 49 because of the weather it, it's been. It's been crazy. I had a student three years ago, high individual with a 16 in the senior division. Was not expecting him to uh, come out third overall. And it's just crazy. So if you start doing the math, your kids to be successful on the state level each stu each student needs to be shooting 17 or high to be successful at area being the top four teams to be a state qualifier because the top four teams top four individuals are state qualifiers they need to be as a team they need to be hitting 16 to 16 to 18 apiece. For sure 16. As an individual, they need to be hitting 17 or 18 apiece, no matter what. And I was really hoping this year I was gonna have the one kid that show up to state and hit a 20 because he did it 16, he did it six times at home. He did it six times at home this year, shot a 17 at state. I was still happy. He was still happy I was shot, but it, it, when you, for how this course is set up, to hit a perfect score is tough. It really is. And for him to do that at home was just unbelievable. But really, okay, for a teacher, and for, if you're just getting started, so there's 20 points on the board, okay? You have two shell, you get to shoot twice no matter what, even on these singles, because that's a single target. That's a double, that's a double. Two targets, two targets. Okay? Let's forget about this being two targets and make it one target. You should have one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. In my mind, I can't not be upset with my student if he shoots a 12. As long as he hits one target, every time he says pull, he's doing right by me. They should always be able to hit 12 targets no matter what. And here's the other thing. If they miss on their first shot, another thing you need to teach your kids is stay on that same target and shoot it a, a second time. Because they're more likely to hit it a second time than they are to hit the second target. Okay? Especially if it's already dropping. They might as well go again on that same target twice and says flip into the other one. So always remember, they should be able to walk away. If you have trained them right, if you have practiced the right way, they should be able to walk away from this contest hitting at least 12 targets. Especially your juniors. If they hit that, you should be happy. You should not be upset whatsoever. Now my seniors, yeah, I'll be upset. But at least they, they, they went in there fair. They came out fair. Because they should, oh, you should always be able to hit at least three targets out of one station. Does that help? Yep. So hopefully, your shoes should always hit 12. Hopefully they're an average of a 15. If they're, if they're a 15 shooter, they're, they're, they're good. They're decent. Because 15, 30, 45, 45 score with a team is usually going to get you out of your area. Yeah. About to run out of time. Sorry, everyone. All right. So, 
if you're able to purchase or get donations for shotguns that you can hold under your team, this is what the wildlife department uses at the contest. It's a Stoger over and under. It's called the Condor. Like I said earlier, I really, I really like this gun and then I really don't like it. One of the best things about it, this is an actual heavy duty firearm shotgun. Okay? It's got some weight to it. That little old Johnny who's a buck ten, it's not going to put him in the dirt like some, like some others. Me, right out of college, I went and bought me one of those nice uh, TriStar over and unders. I love it. I love it. It's awesome for me to go hunting, but when I go put 50 rounds through it, I'm, my shoulder is black and blue because this firearm is light as a feather. It's made for to go in the fields and walk 20 miles, but not to put 50 rounds in it. This firearm here is meant to put some rounds th through it. It's heavy. It's heavy. I like it. Now, after a season of probably a thousand rounds in it, it might be a little bit worn out. Because we usually send one a year back to the manufacturer to get replaced or get rebuilt. That's either how much we're shooting or how, or how he heavy or how much we work on them all the time. Now, one of the positive notes on this firearm is that it has an automatic safety. Every time it breaks open, the safety automatically comes on every single time. Now, like I was saying, I wish this contest had a couple of mulligans or so. If you don't forget to take your safety off and you say pull, it's a zero. And it really stinks. It really, really stinks. And back when we was using the 870s, and to make sure we did it, a lot of us coaches, and even my coach was saying, when you get your pump action, when you get your 870, take the safety off, leave it off. Okay, that was fine. Because honestly, once we was done shooting, the action was open, I was the only one handling it, I needed to keep my finger off the trigger. And that was education. And sometimes we still teach our kids that way because you are the main safety. Not just the mechanism because mechanisms fail all the time. So, if your student forgets to take the safety off, they are going and say pull and go to shoot and act like they're trying to shoot but can't because they forgot to take the safety off, it's a zero. And it is, and that is not going to help out themselves or the team. Now, most over and under, especially pretty expensive ones, have a barrel selector, as in you can pick the top or the bottom barrel to shoot. This one you cannot. It's an automatic bottom barrel shoots every single time. So at practice, especially my newbies, I'm not giving them two shells to shoot. I'm giving them one, and it's usually a straightaway target. Now, once I pick my teams, or really start feeling comfortable with the kids, then we're putting two shells in the barrel every time, and we're shooting the full course like we do at contest. Other than that, other than that bottom barrel really doesn't matter unless you're practicing them with one shell at a time, but bottom barrel is the first one that shoots. If you have this firearm, have extra chokes because they break all the time, especially if you're shooting with steel shot. I highly recommend getting those ones that are extended choke tubes that you can actually um, screw in by hand. They're also a little bit stronger, a little bit better as well. So, let's talk about chokes for just a minute before I forget. You have different choke cylinders that can help you with your shot. And it's really based on the distance that you're trying to shoot. You have full choke, modified choke, improved cylinder, and even a skeet choke. 
and this goes at the top of the barrel and it affects the shock pattern. A lot of people think that a shotgun is just this big old ball of pellets coming at you. Not so much, okay? What it really is, it's basically, okay, it, think of it like a football, throwing a football out. That's your shock pattern. And at a distance is when it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So you have full choke. So, here's your type of chokes. From full down to skate is that they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? If I'm going turkey hunting, I'm using a full choke. Because I'm aiming at that turkey's head. Another thing is, I don't want a bunch of pellets into that turkey breast either. I'm aiming for their head. Most of the time we are using a modified, maybe an improved, for this contest. Because we need to be able to reach out there at 16 to 20 yards to be able to break that target. If you're using the full choke, you may actually miss it a lot of the times. Here, you're trying to use distance plus expansion to help you hit that target. Skeet choke is one of the biggest ones. You use that when you're actually shooting skeet. And if you haven't shot skeet before, you need to go with someone and you'll understand why it's such a big choke. Why it ends up being such a big pattern. Because you're actually only 12 yards away but they're going straight left and right in front of you. That's the big kicker. So usually you want to use a modified, maybe an improved cylinder. Sometimes you can find an improved modified, but that's your best bet because it's distance plus the expansion you need to be able to hit that target. So, but, Back on the Stoger overall personal experience, just be ready to replace it often, okay? When you shoot it so much with your teams, it can go through a lot. I started this when I came back to Prague, which is my hometown. My dad been coaching there for years, still is, still is helping me coach it. Um, one thing he asked, can we start doing like parent meeting or a little class setting. I said yes. Guess what? It looks good on the national chapter application as well. So we started hosting, especially like my first time shooters. It's mandatory that they have to come to this. Because basically what I'm kind of went through with y'all is what I do with them. And we talk about shooting techniques, safety procedural, chokes, and what our expectations is out there at the shooting range. Because if they truly care about showing up, they're going to show up to this meeting. And I can also tell who's actually going to be there and put emphasis in. And I also know it's going to be a lot safer as well. And like we might be spending like an hour and a half from like 6 to 7.30 and have the student and parent there. Because also, you're going to have those dads, those sports dads, that be like, oh, little Johnny is number one in football, number one in baseball. This is also his sport because we are big time hunters that always go up to Nebraska, Illinois, and stuff like that. Well, guess what? Little Johnny can't even shoot the broadside of a, of a barn. And you got little Johnny's dad, who acts like this at the football games, loud as Texas, 
at shooting practice. We try to nip that, nip that in the rear end really fast as we can. Another reason why I put in that permission slip agreement, have any reason to dismiss the student. It might be because of the parent I dismissed the student, even. Because we don't need to have that type of attitude at practice. Do you ever say that like practice is a parent-free zone? Have you ever done that? No, I, it's never been something that I've discouraged parents not to come to. Because if I had no parents out there whatsoever, it would just be two adults for maybe like 20 kids. And I'm shooting on my school farm. So I need to have a little extra adult supervision if possible. And luckily with myself, I've never had to tell a parent to leave. Now my coach, my dad, he's had to do it before in the past. And so, and unfortunately that student never came back out. And it wasn't the student's fault. It was the parent. If you have parents who, so like I personally don't have any experience, but I love to be out on the range. I just am not very good at coaching. So if you have a parent that steps up and like volunteers to coach, like how, how do you gauge, yes, I should allow this parent to, no, I shouldn't allow this parent to. Like I've never seen that person shoot. I don't know what experience they have, how would you have that conversation with them? That might be a good question. It might be something someone else can help me answer that. Um, and I've thought about that many times. Um, yes, go I ahead. Think, I think ultimately, I mean, they can come out and help. I mean, I think your administration should back you to the point to say, you're the coach, they're the assistant coach that might know a lot more about technique and stuff like that, but ultimately, it's your, it, it all kind of falls to you, since you're the FFA advisor. You're in charge of their safety, um, all of them, making sure they meet the eight hour requirement and stuff like that. And that might be something you just need to discuss with your administrator and so say, look, little Johnny's dad wants to come out and help coach. Are you okay with that, knowing that I'm going to be the coach, but he's going to be the coach? 100% agree with that. Because I, I never, I never want to step away completely and just be like, all right, you take the contest, you do that, because that's my job, that's what I get paid for. But I, I don't know a lot, and so I was trying to figure out how to. I know a lot of schools that they have a coach, and I know some ag teachers just leave it all to them, and I like, don't do that because that takes away that takes away from your your um. What am I looking to say? Job security. I mean, we all try to find someone who, with electricity, hey, come help me coach this team. You're still the coach. They're an assistant coach. They may know more about it. But guess what? You're the one in charge. You're the one who says yes or no. But also, like, learn with them. Because always the best stuff that I've always had most success with is what I, I'm learning with them. I'm learning with that coach or that aide or with the students. That's how I was getting successful with the students. Okay, I only got about a minute left. Okay. Um, NRA certified. Nothing in the rule says you have to be a shotgun certified instructor. You can, and this part goes into what we were just talking about, you can sign up with the NRA and actually get shotgun certified and actually have a certificate. And I highly recommend doing it. Um, my dad coaches one he's been one for a long time I've never really had to get get it I'm going to and you can possibly maybe get this paid with 412 I don't know for a fact but you possibly could um, I did have a parent from another school that talked to me about it 
It was a weekend trip down to Fort Worth in Texas. Enjoyed it. It was a fun getaway weekend, nothing crucial, but they actually learned some stuff that they didn't think about before and was able to use it for themselves, their kids, and the school that they're helping out with. Yes, ma'am. I think if you have enough people in your area that are going to do it, they will come to use. I'm not sure on that. I think they I think will. If you have enough teachers in your area, they'll come to you. They also have a grant. They already has a grant. Yes. Last thing, the, the, those six throwers, they're all like 15 to 2,000 apiece. NRA found a found NRA grant. Is it under foundation NRA found? Friends of the NRA. Friends of the NRA. You can put in every single year, and it's usually due uh, January 1. Put it on top of your list for a thrower. That's how Preg has like eight throwers. Because we always put one at the top of our list to get a new thrower every year. Um, another good grant opportunity <coughs> is one of, my, one of the previous teachers at my school set up a Midway USA Foundation endowment. Um, and that's really cool because Midway USA will match anything you put into that team endowment. Um, so once you set one up, there's a cash grant that's available every year. And I think it's available two times a year, actually. But you can pull on that cash grant, and you only have to put in, you know, if all you can donate that year is $300, Midway will match that $300. And so now you have $600 added into your job. So I'm still trying to learn that. But that's something a previous teacher had set up. For yes. Everyone, I hope I covered as much as I, I can. If you would like to have my email, I'm always willing to help out anybody. If someone wants to come to one of our practices this fall, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> Roughly like 450 bucks. What's it cost to get them emailed on that? <laughs> I'm going to give you an address. Okay. Um, it depends on how bad it is. One time they sent us a brand new gun instead. Are you done? Yep, we're done. Okay, great. Right. If you guys have something you are doing, um, we're going to be transitioning to Dr. Clyde. Thank you for your keys. You were now much in the first of all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.